Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, you have been enjoying the summer school program and the refresher course as well from Ayuka. And particularly at the end of all these things, I am happy to bring you an afternoon talk, a late afternoon talk. And this is more about very basic stuff which uh, one can do as, uh, as towards uh, hosting and astronomy lab. So of course, uh, not everybody would be hosting a, a lab, but uh, let, let the title be uh, more relevant to the people uh, attending the refresher course who would be probably teachers uh, in colleges and other institutions where you would like to also have some uh, laboratory sessions, some actual hands-on work with astronomy. Of course, uh, astrophysics, we've all been going through great lectures by several experts. And you must have also learned about some uh, astronomy uh, observational stuff. Uh, I'm going to just present very basic uh, kind of, let's see, let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to present a very uh, basic idea of how you can build your capacity towards actually taking a lab course in, uh, in astronomy. So, uh, for the students who are here, of course, uh, you may at some point of time become faculty at some place and would also uh, probably benefit from these pointers that I have collected here. But otherwise also just look at these as you know suggestions for what you can do with uh, your, let's say you have an astro club. If you already have one, that's lovely. But if you don't, then maybe you can set up one in your own college or in your own community, in your circles. And uh, what are the kind of things that you could invest in or look for support for if you want to have a good observational capacity? So uh, let these be uh, pointers for uh, both of the kind of audience that I have, have, have today. So uh, to start with, of course, I mean, if you want to do astronomy, you have to have telescopes. And I'll quickly go through the kind of telescopes that are available. So for telescopes, uh, you have very basic types, uh, the Galileans, which are of course optical uh, arrangements in which refraction is used. So these are also called refractors. Uh, Galileo had invented the art of using telescopes for astronomy. I'm not going to say he had invented the telescope because there were many other people working on lenses at that time, but he was the first person to go ahead and use this kind of a telescope to look at the sky. Of course, being the first to use a telescope in such a vast field, he was one of the first to discover so many things as well, right? So this telescope, uh, this kind of telescope is of course named after him because he came out with the most important application of it, other than maybe finding out if the enemy is coming from afar. Um, so, Sometimes uh, when we think of Galileans, we only think of pirate glasses, eyeglasses or something. Well, that's, that's not all. I mean, you can make Galilean telescopes which are bigger than what Galileo had used. So when I mean, uh, when I say bigger, I mean to say the diameter of the primary lens is uh, being referred to when I say big or small. So uh, if you can see in this tiny diagram, the, this is the primary lens and then which allows the parallel light from far off objects to come through and get focused somewhere, depending on its focal length. Then it's the job of the eyepiece to convert this light, this uh, first converging and then diverging light into a parallel beam, which your eye can sense, right? This is quite important to uh, know about your primary lens and the eyepiece lens when you're using a Galilean telescope or any telescope, in fact, you need to know what your eyepieces are. So this is uh, the very basic uh, you know, tool that a person can use. And in fact, uh, when I asked people, have you ever used a telescope? They would look at me and say, no, I have never used a telescope. And I asked them, have you used binoculars? They say, yeah, yeah, of course, binoculars are in everybody's house. If everybody goes you know, to look for birds or they go on an adventure, they have binoculars. Well. Binoculars are just two telescopes, right? And it's two telescopes for two eyes. So there are two Galilean telescopes. 
So in case your club or your group or your uh, institution has a very good binocular, that also can serve as a, you know, as two Galilean telescopes. Right. And in fact, there can be some fun observations, uh, naked eye observations with telescopes uh, in front that can be done with uh, binoculars, which allow a very lovely, beautiful wide field view. So, uh, I mean, if, if you want, you can make your own small Galilean telescope, etc., with uh, material available in the market. But then, uh, when you really talk about good observations, observations that you want to record, you want to photograph, etc., those kinds of Galileans become very expensive. And simply because of that, the rest of the talk is not going to include Galilean telescopes. So that's why I'm talking so much about it right here. Uh, Galilean telescopes need the primary lens to be really good quality and the optics has to be very perfect. And doing getting that done is uh, turning out to be very costly in these days when lenses are not so uh, in appeal basically. So people are looking at more uh, looking at the reflecting kind of telescopes where concave mirrors are used. So of course, uh, Gregory and uh, Newton, uh, they both uh, uh, kind of worked on a certain type of telescope which had uh, the use of a concave mirror. Right? Now, the primary of a Galilean focuses the light, parallel light coming in from infinity or far off objects. And similarly, in a Newtonian telescope, the concave mirror focuses the light, but it focuses it in the direction of the incoming light. Right? Uh, I'm sorry opposite to the direction of the incoming light. So uh, it essentially goes back towards the same direction. However, with a clever ploy, they have uh, put a small mirror, flat mirror in this case, at a 45 degree angle, which diverts the light, uh, which is getting focused towards the focus into a hole, which is on the side of the body of the telescope, right? And that's where you can put your eyepiece and get a look at the object that is to be viewed. Of course, the small piece of glass, which uh, changes the direction of the light, does obstruct some of the incoming light. And therefore, we have to have a compromise. The compromise is that the mirrors can be made much bigger in, the, in a lesser price compared to the same diameter of a lens. Okay, So this is quite important when you do not have much funding you want to make do with the least expenses. So if you want to have, let's say a six inch lens, that would be exorbitantly priced, right? And if you have a six inch mirror, it is dirt cheap. I mean, compared to the lens, it's quite cheap, right? And in fact, you can yourself grind your own uh, six inch mirror at home in, in easily and make your own telescope. Right? Several people have been doing it with the Ayuka Public Outreach Program and we have had great success with almost everybody, including children of 10th standard, succeeding in making their own telescopes, reflecting telescopes. So uh, in this kind of telescope, you can uh, see the similar, uh, you can see that a similar kind of diameter or even much bigger diameter can be achieved for a lesser price and lesser effort. So in that case, you can always afford to lose out on a little bit of that area by having this reflecting mirror. Okay. So Newtonians are quite popular with uh, amateur astronomers. As I said, they're easy to make yourself. So therefore they have a greater appeal. In fact, I have some suggestions related to uh, which telescope to choose. And this will be one of the prime ones for amateurs. Then we have uh, further advances in the technology of making telescopes. If you uh, noticed in the Newtonian kind of telescope, the telescope is actually allowing you to see the light perpendicular to the direction of the object. Okay. The direct object is in this direction. You have to look at it you know, from a perpendicular direction. Well, for some cases, some uses, it is very useful. This thing is very useful, this feature. But for some other purposes, this was not uh, being useful. And therefore, we had to find a way to make the uh, image appear in the same direction as the light was traveling. Something very similar to the direction of light in the Galilean telescopes. 
Okay. So Schmidt Cassegrain, this system was developed, and in this, they were using a another mirror here. Okay. Instead of a flat mirror, they were using a concave mirror here, and they actually made a hole in the primary uh, mirror and allowed the light to pass through so that it would go to the lens here, the eyepiece lens, and get focused outwards. Rather, uh, it, would, it would get uh, out so that you could look through it and see the image. So this was a very good way. And uh, in fact, uh, for photography, etc., this may be one of the better uh, methods of doing it because then you can point your telescope much easily. Uh, there's another kind of telescope, which is the Microsoft telescope, which is a kind of uh, advancement on this right, with some other uh, correcting lenses, etc., included. And that is also quite popular if you go to higher end uh, uses of telescopes. Now, uh, the sizes for uh, reflectors, uh, let me, as I said, suggest a few sizes in case you are going for a telescope. Right? Then you should look at your uh, use of the telescope. The telescope, if it is to be used mostly for the wide field observations or for outreach purposes where you actually take a telescope to some uh, school or, or even, even your community, right? you could uh, use a six inch. This is good and this is also quite portable. Right? In fact, uh, if you want an improvement in the aperture, aperture is the, is the uh, diameter of uh, the hole which allows the light to go in, or you can just say the aperture means the diameter of the primary, then uh, you could even go for an eight or 10 inch. Now these would be difficult to make yourself, while six inch you can make yourself. Right? But eight or 10 inches are also good for such purposes where you want a slight improvement in the aperture. So you can see things, see fainter things. And these things are still easy to transport. So uh, many a times, um, Astro labs have to have the telescope out in the night, but then it has to go back into a room in the evening, right? So it would be great if you know the students themselves, one or two students, if they're coming for observations, they should be able to carry the telescope themselves to wherever the observation is happening from, right? So lightweight, six inch, eight inch, 10 inch are good enough. Right? And uh, they also come in various types. Like, as I said, uh, they, these would mostly be in the Newtonian or Cassegrain kind of types. Now, you could also go for 12 to 14 inch telescopes. In fact, 11 to 14 inch, let me say, uh, for some research class observations, right? Now, these would be costly. These would not be handmade. Uh, and if you, if you kind of took up the uh, challenge of making a 12 inch telescope, it could, uh, you could end up spending a year making the primary and perfecting it because they have to be very parabolic in shape. So, <clears throat> People uh, invest in these kind of telescopes if they want to have some research class, basic research class observations done. I will tell you what kind of observations are possible with these slightly later in the talk. So 12 to 14 inch would be uh, suitable for such uh, purposes. Now they would be costly and they would go into lakhs, uh, definitely. Right? And of course, uh, the more advanced the telescopes, the more advanced its accessories are. Right? You would not just want to put, an, put a simple eyepiece into a 14 inch telescope and just look at the moon with it. You would want to do more stuff. So what are the accessories uh, that you should have? Now, I would suggest that you have these three definitely for any telescope. So you should have a solar filter <coughs> to look at the sun, take its observations. A moon filter, which can be quite uh, useful. and definitely a extremely good IP set. Right? Uh, you should invest in very good eyepieces because if you're going to do uh, observations with your eye, and many a times they are very uh, you know, rewarding and also sometimes they're needed when you're also using an imaging device, but you need an eyepiece to um, you know, look at something and uh, decide on some parameters, etc. So a good IP set should definitely be there and uh, if you're doing outreach, you go for the wide field ones, which are easy. These are, they're called eye relief also. And go for metallic ones if possible, because they are more hardy and they won't break. They like fall down from your hand in the dark, right? And these are things we need to consider because yes, we will be working in the dark when working with telescopes and doing nighttime astronomy, right? 
So uh, go for these three, definitely. Whenever you're shopping for a telescope and accessories, this should be on your list. Now, of course, uh, as I said, uh, other than this, you can make your own telescopes. And if you want to get details of that, please feel free to um, send an email to me. I have given my email address and I'll give it later. Okay. So now um, the mount, come to the mount, which is actually another very important part of a telescope assembly. I've just been talking about the tubes and the optics included in them, but of course the telescope, such a big thing cannot be handheld, right? You have to have, have something which is very stable and will hold the telescope. It, it is not just to uh, reduce shake of your hands, but there are many other criteria which uh, are useful in deciding what kind of mount you should have. Right? So this is just like, you know, sitting on a horse is called mounting it. You put a telescope on this to first of all, support it, support the weight. Right? But after that a purpose is done, you should also be able to move it uh, easily in any direction that you choose to observe it. Right? So therefore, uh, one of the easiest kind of mounts that is easiest to use is the alt as mount, it is the altitude azimuth mount. It is basically something which simply moves left, right and up and down. So left, right for an astronomer is the azimuth uh, axis. Uh, it goes as it goes from the north, which is zero degree, and back to the north, going through 360 degrees. And uh, altitude is the angle made from the horizon upward. So that's the up and down motion. Now, this is pretty easy to uh, develop, and you can even make something with plywood if you like, and hold the telescope tube and just move it up and down and left to right. But of course, there are tripods which could help you do this. Right. So this is uh, one kind of. Uh, alt as mount that you will see here. So uh, this uh, you can see has uh, a rod here and three legs supporting it nicely, stably. This is probably cast iron. And here you have the mount. So this is, of course, the stand will be there. Stand, the mount can be fitted to different kind of stand also. Uh, this is very well suited for the amateur astronomers because it can easily hold a six inch or even an eight inch, 10 inch telescope. 10 inch would become slightly heavier, but uh, still probably uh, do a good job with this. Right? So 6 inch, 8 inch definitely can go on to an alt as mount, which are very easy to move. They just You just have to move left, right, up and down to reach the object and then lock the mount. But for some other purposes, like if you want to follow an object for a longer while, you need to have an equatorial mount. Now, this can be sometimes called an alt as mount with the axis, one of the axis inclined so that it matches your latitude. So you are basically, in this case, you see, this is the this is one of the axis. Okay, this is the axis and the, uh, the telescope will turn around this axis. So that is basically inclined from the horizontal at an angle. And that angle has to be fixed to your latitude. For Pune here, it's around 18 and a half degrees. So we, fixes at 18 and a half degrees just before uh, beginning any observation and then keep it fixed. The other uh, axis goes like this. And by fixing this axis towards the pole star basically, what we do is that the uh, telescope's axis are now coinciding with the motion of the sky in the array and the deck, the right ascension and the declination axis of the sky coordinate system. Right. So if you are if the, the axis of this telescope, one of these uh, axis is towards the pole star, it is basically matching the uh, axis of the earth. And therefore, uh, any movement around that axis will be on the right ascension axis. And then perpendicular to that, if you have any other axis moving, that will take you out and the telescope to looking towards the, uh, looking over the various declination angles. Right? So this is quite useful. And what I have seen here is another basic one. This can also be used for uh, amateur astronomy. And therefore, you can um, have various kinds of uh, uh, combinations of uh, stand and you know, mount. This is a very low weight capacity mount. That is also something that you should consider because depending on the weight of your tube, you'll have to use a uh, sturdy or a low weight mount. 
you can see here there's an addition of a weight. Now, um, of course, uh, while moving on the RA axis and also in the deck axis, the tube will go beyond the center of gravity of this stand. Right? If the tube is to go on top here, okay? then if you move it to that side, it will topple over. For that, uh, we have to have a counterweight which will balance it off. And this is one of the first things we do. If you have an uh, equatorial mount, you balance the axis, both the axis. One of them is open, one of them is locked, and the uh, weight of the instrument is balanced first. Right? So this can be done, uh, and this is the additional thing that is there in an equatorial norm, other than it being inclined to the uh, angle of your latitude. Now, what you can do extra is that while this is there, uh, you can add a tracker motor to one of the axes. Now, this could be a simple uh, engineering project also if you want to just make a track, make a motor, which basically moves at one RPD, one rotation per day. That is the rate of the motion of the sky, right? This comes back almost at the, to the same point in one day. So if you can have one RPD motor fixed to this, it will slowly move the uh, axis. And if you, if you, all you have to do is just move the RA axis, the declination will be uh, fixed. So you just move the RA axis and the telescope will keep tracking the object that you have chosen to see, right? unless it has its own big motion, like maybe the moon has its own motion. But for purposes uh, which last about an hour or so, it's, it's, it's fine, you can do with this. Um, <clears throat> so you can either do this uh, jugad where you add a equatorial, uh, add a tracker motor to an equatorial mount, or you can get a motorized mount with remote, Right. Then you have remotes which allow you to move both the axes in, uh, in independently, right? And they are motorized. So these would be costlier. So depending on your budget, you can choose amongst these. You could go for automated ones. Now there are mounts in which there is a CPU added where you just punch in the coordinates. You set it up first. You align it, collaborate. Uh, sorry. Uh, first make it uh, collimated, etc. And then you have just to enter the coordinates of the object that you want to go to, and the telescope will itself move to that object. Right? Amazing uh, technology when we <laughs> first saw it. Now it seems to be uh, very regular, and people can also nowadays use their mobile phones to connect to their own, uh, you know, go to mounts and do this. Right? So that is possible. You can uh, you can invest in that kind of amount. I'm sorry, I just skipped this one. You can invest in that kind of a mount where there's a CPU in, in built inside here, and the motors are quite strong and the thing is quite sturdy. But again, the cost becomes a big factor. The other, uh, the ultimate kind are the computer controlled mounts, which are for bigger kind of telescopes, let's say above uh, 14 inch kind of telescopes, which you know people should be just setting up once and leaving them like that. So you should not be touching them. In case you want to have an observatory with a dome, etc., in your own um, campus uh, where the telescope will be there, just uh, look for these automated go to mounts or the computerized mounts. This will be costly but very accurate and very sturdy. Um, these cannot be shaken. There are, there are ways to make them uh, in a way that they cannot be shaken even when the building is shaking due to wind or other reasons. So uh, your images will always be nice and sharp. So these are mounts and their accessories. They come with uh, the more advanced ones come with various kinds of remotes with various kinds of data loaded. They would have 7,000 objects, 70,000 objects. And uh, there's a huge range of these things available as well. Right? Now, the, these can also be connected through various kinds of ports which are available to your own laptop and uh, used directly from there. Okay. Now, after you've done all these things, you've got a good setup, either a low-end setup or a high-end setup, but you would definitely want to capture the images that you are taking and uh, keep them for later. So either you would just want to share it on social media or you may want to actually uh, download them and do some data analysis on these images based on these images. So, uh, of course, uh, the range of mobile device uh, says these days have very, very good cameras. And so therefore I have been uh, very happy to include mobile camera as well in the uh, list of uh, 
imaging devices. Right? I've seen some people send me very, very nice uh, and quite sharp photos taken with mobile camera. Although they have to struggle and juggle a lot to uh, align their mobile camera with the eyepiece of the telescope and then click it. There are also nowadays devices available which would allow you to clamp the cam mobile camera to the eyepiece holder and then you can set the focus properly and take good pictures. But they are, I mean, more for, as I said, social media purposes right now. There are also prosumer cameras available. These are, uh, these are cameras which are used by professionals and consumers also. So these are not too costly, right? In the mobile, of course, the mobile is the most costly thing. Camera just comes with it. But in the prosumer one, you have a good camera. It allows you a lot of tweaking of the image, right? And it gives you a lot of control on how the image will be taken, especially in astronomy. Uh, when you want to photograph something, you need to have long exposures. You need to have um, control over the ISO, the, uh, the aperture, etc. The time is also important to be, the exposure time is also to, uh, to be controlled. So therefore, these become useful because they allow a certain amount of a degree of freedom in choosing these parameters. But of course, uh, they have a fixed lens. So they have a lens which has to be used. As I said, a mobile camera, of course, has a lens, so you have to struggle a lot to bring it to the same focal, uh, to match the focal length of the eyepiece and your uh, imaging device. So you have to do that struggle with these as well. So uh, the better choice would be a cheaper DSLR, a uh, digital single lens reflex camera, or you could even go for higher end ones, which have very, very good performance and extremely low noise. In fact, they are in many projects being used as the primary device for um, imaging and observations. So these uh, allow you the, uh, the advantage of taking off the lens, right? So you, you don't have a lens and you can directly attach them with the proper uh, rings to your own telescope eyepiece holder, right? And you remove the eyepiece, so there's no in-between things. So your light comes directly from your uh, primary and goes into the sensor right so therefore these allow uh, you extremely good uh, imaging now uh, they also come with very good uh, sensors like cmos uh, sensors they have um, pretty good cooling some of them do not have an ir filter so you could go for ir regions of uh, your imaging uh, objects as well other than these, of course, the, for, a, for, a, for a long, long time, astronomy has been depending on CCDs, the charge coupled device imaging, imaging, imaging devices. Right? These are uh, ones which have the best performance, but many of them are mono, uh, mono color. So you have to have a filter in front of them so that you can choose to image, let's say, in red, green, blue, etc. But of course, if you can afford to have a really good CCD, you would get the extremely low noise pictures because these have the ability to be cooled down to a very low noise temperatures. And therefore they give you extremely good uh, results. As I said, as you go down this line, the cost goes up. So it's uh, the choice has to be made by you and it has to depend on what your purpose is. Don't overspend just because uh, you would uh, just like to have something which is uh, well known, don't overspend. Just choose the right one and make the best use of it. Maybe you can buy two of the lesser cost things rather than one of the higher cost things. This is my advice, uh, humble one. Okay, so of course uh, you do all these things. You have now your uh, telescope mount and your imaging devices and you have connected them all together. Now you need to know what to see. Of course, uh, for research level things, you would have done some, uh, already done some research and know that this is the object that I want to see. But in general, if you were just starting with uh, imaging, etc., there are several uh, uh, several things that you can do. And also many of you, I'm sure, would also like to share the sky with the people around you. So that is called outreach, which uh, the Ayuka outreach section has been doing for many, many years now. And what we have seen is that people like information, but uh, when when you start on astronomy, if it may happen that on some days there's nothing in the sky to see, then also you can use certain 
uh, websites and certain apps. Right? So ISS Detector and Heavens Above are two of my favorite apps. Right? And these, uh, other than telling you if the International Space Station or other satellites are passing on top of your head, which is which are very exciting to see, although I don't like the Starlink ones. The ISS detector and heavens above also give you a lot of data about the sky itself. And inbuilt uh, inside them are sky maps. So other than just these uh, satellites shown in the sky or their uh, events um, notified to you, getting notified to you, you can also get information about the sky itself. So they, they can tell you what planets are available. Maybe you can even zoom into the map there and see various details of the sky. So these are multi-purpose and very useful for people who do outreach. Because uh, there are also other uh, sites and apps which can give you very good sky maps. So if you, if you just want plain sky maps to be printed out, you have skymaps.com. Then there's there are apps like Google Sky, Stellarium, and uh, uh, Stellarium, and Carta uh, CL, and Celestia. So things like that are there. So <clears throat> you can use any of these. Some of them are websites. I will uh, not go into which one is what. But you can find your own app, own um, uh, favorite website to use. I particularly would recommend Stellarium because it has been an old favorite of mine. And it has the uh, capacity and the uh, plugins needed to actually uh, communicate with your uh, co computer and uh, your telescope through it. Right? So uh, Stellarium basically shows you the sky virtually on your desktop or on your phone in sometimes. But it also has an interface through something called ASCOM to your, com uh, to your computerized mount. Right? So you can actually use Stellarium, uh, Stellarium's beautiful uh, view, and then point to some object, click on it, right click and say track to it, and your telescope properly, uh, you know, if it's properly communicating with this, then it can actually directly go to that object. Now, in that case, you would be uh, just buying a mount which can, which is motorized, and you need not invest in the CPU which has all these <clears throat> objects loaded inside. So that's uh, so you need to get information as well. Now these are uh, apps or websites that I told you about. These are something that you can uh, get information about very, very broad things like the sky or the sky maps in general. But then of course the, there are very pointed things that you might be wanting to observe. So let's quickly uh, come to that. So what are the observing suggestions? What may you be looking forward to observing in this, uh, with this setup? So uh, I have classified them uh, in, in these uh, particular fields. And uh, of course, the slides would probably be made available. And uh, you can always go back and look at them in a broad sense and think of other observations other than what I am suggesting. So um, let's start with the sun, because that will be uh, taking you and keeping you busy in the daytime. Most of the time, uh, your uh, astronomy, we think of it as something done at night. But of course, the sun is there half of the day. Uh, and we can look at a lot of things happening on it. Right? So first thing uh, you could do is just spot the sunspots. So you have to have your telescope ready with a solar filter. This is something which will cut out almost 99% of the light of the sun and then allow your telescope to collect the light. The solar filter goes first. That's the first thing between the sun and anything that is afterwards, including you, yourself, your eyes, your telescope, etc. Solar filter first. And then your telescope. And then you allow the very, very uh, less amount of light to pass through. And that still, that can give you a lot of information. So you can make images of the sun's face uh, in general in white light, as we would call it. And just follow if uh, th there are sunspots. Of course, we now know that uh, the solar activity uh, comes and goes, but uh, right now we are in the uh, fag end of a cycle, a uh, cycle which is going down. So if you uh, note this thing, you can see the sunspots numbers increases, and along with that, irradiance and uh, solar flares and radio flux also increases. So there's a direct correlation between solar activity and the presence of sunspots. Right now, they are less, 
but uh, in a few years they might keep coming keep uh, increasing in number and monitoring this is very important and not just solar astronomers do this but anybody giving extra data uh, contributes to the science so you could be uh, one of them <clears throat> now you could also look at the sun with something called the h alpha filter right and you can see the difference here on the right side you can see a what i call white light image basically it looks yellow but uh, the image in all kind of wavelengths that our eyes can see right so it's taken just with a simple imaging device with the photosphere of the sun visible and here you can see a sunspot group now you could also use something called the h alpha filter which basically uh, allows you to see only the h alpha lines right so h alpha line is uh, emitted by the hydrogen but it is not right at the photosphere it is slightly above the photosphere and going more into the corona right so therefore you can uh, you can look at this narrow slice of the spectrum and see the actual activity the very transient and the the active sun in that wavelength right you can see actually the contrast here it's a very plain smooth sun here in white light so many uh, different things to see as soon as you turn on the h alpha magic so this filter has to go after the solar filter again i repeat that solar filter is the first thing cuts out 99% or more of the light then the rest of the things follow right then you allow only the h alpha light to pass through and then you get to see all these things like prominences pqs fibrils flares etc right so that's for the sun so the sun can be seen with uh, white light or h alpha and various features can be seen or studied over time and recorded uh, there's also an experiment which we have uh, been describing for the masters level uh, students so they either you do it unofficially or by yourself if you have a telescope or you can do it as a part of a a uh, lab uh, experiment in which what you study is the darkening of the limb limb is the edge of the sun right so uh, the edge of uh, a, a disk of a celestial body is usually called the limb so this is the solar limb we also have the lunar limb etc what you would notice here is that this, at the center the photosphere is quite bright and as you go towards the edge it becomes slightly darker could actually see it in the previous picture as well here it's brighter and it goes darker here yeah. it happens in h alpha as well so what is happening is here in this direction if the light has to come to you it has to travel through a, a larger amount of solar atmosphere therefore the extinction is more and you get less light uh, as you go towards the edge of the so now this uh, is an interesting experiment to do to study this darkening effect and take its note and see how the variation happens across the limb so you can see that uh, it's not just looking at uh, sunspots etc you can actually go into some details of the sun uh, sitting here right here and do this even with a very small telescope in fact you could also probably do this with a 2 inch telescope because it's good enough to um, uh, take enough number of enough amount of light you cannot do a uh, high resolution imaging with small telescopes but for a uh, photometry kind of purposes small telescopes are good enough other than that you can of course look at the moon you get you could follow its phases we just had something called a moon challenge please look it up on our uh, on our uh, outreach channels or social media etc you could just follow the phases of the moon you could take pictures of it you can take high resolution pictures of it and actually do some studies about the lunar features yes there are many uh, uh, many uh, maps available online uh, which <coughs> give you the names of the features etc go through this this is quite an exciting uh, <coughs> exciting activity to do i would say uh, just to even know which are the features but other than that you could actually do some imaging of the moon and find out the uh so physical characteristics for example if you want to say uh, find out how big is this small crater uh, called copernicus on the moon right what what you have to do is you have to know something called the plate scale of your uh, or the pixel width of your camera okay that you are using so you see if you know that if you know how much angular distance equals to 1 pixel on your camera right 
and you know how many pixels are there because uh, through uh, image processing software you can find out how many pixels are from here till here on this or if you take a larger body let's say this serena tatis um, sea of um, serenity you could take the whole uh, distance between here to here find out how many pixels are there know the angular resolution of that and there you have the actual uh, angular size on the moon if you know the diameter of the moon on that particular date and time you know the actual size of the object right now you can go to finer levels higher resolutions and find out details about the um, lunar uh, features so this is uh, something exciting that i would suggest we could do at uh, even at msc level it's, it's 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 it not just tells you about the moon but it also also tells you more about your camera itself your imaging device itself so it's a, it features a lot of uh, thought and uh, investigation about your instruments as well as the astrophysical object uh, of course you can look at other moons not just our own moon uh, jupiter's moons are quite popular in fact they are called galilean the first four are called the galilean moons because obviously galileo discovered them with his first small telescope uh, they are always moving around jupiter in fact galileo himself had noted down its motions their motions in uh, his sketches right and so uh, you could have uh, the motions of the moons and various kinds of things like transits eclipses happen uh, with them so some of them may one of them may go behind jupiter or come in front of it cast a shadow on it all these lovely uh, events happen these can be very well studied even with a 6 inch telescope but given a 14 inch telescope probably you could also go to such a good level of uh, observation i'm not going to show you pictures like the galileo spacecraft had taken because that's unreasonable to uh, imagine that uh, being taken by this but with good image processing you could really take uh, seriously good pictures of jupiter also from right from right here from your observatory so uh, you could do certain things like you know finding out the orbital periods determination of light speed which is also a, you know one of the earlier methods which had been used to do this and uh, you could find out jupiter's rotation period if you need a project to do so a uh, study of jovian moons could be uh, leading to all these things and here's a graph uh, just made in a emax tool here you can see the just an example of how let's say callisto moves so callisto has a huge period of uh, you see and from the previous picture it's, it's obvious because callisto is very far away from jupiter so it would have a big curve and similarly the other uh, moons are plotted here uh, you could look at uh, when you're talking about phases phases of moon you could look at phases of venus in fact venus has just passed from being a evening star to a morning star so it's very close to the sun and it will probably be in such a phase such as thin crescent but a huge uh, angular size so you probably be able to catch it if, if, you're, if you're doing this now uh, but then you should be able to catch this sequence because it doesn't take too long to go through the sequence uh, over its period which is less than a year so uh, any uh, any astronomy course could have you know tracking this as one of the projects <clears throat> you could not just do that you could track asteroids so if you properly know uh, the uh, if you if you know uh, the path of an asteroid and if it's passing <coughs> by in your sky <coughs> excuse me you could make observations of it and you could in fact also help in orbital determ determination because uh, whatever you uh, see there in the sky we could uh, help, help uh, refine the ephemeris which is the determination of the path of the object in a better way right and uh, you could do asteroid path detection you could uh, do orbit determination you could do astrono astrometry all these may have already been done for example in this picture you can see eros the uh, asteroid being observed from pune so we were able to catch it with a dslr camera and a small telescope and you can see uh, in the in the field of stars this these bright really bright dots are the stars and this set of uh, bright dots in a line is eros so while the stars are not moving that much eros has been seen moving like this right 
and join this and plot its uh, line and you get its kind of get an idea of the orbit right this glow here is the glow from the city so it's just causing noise in the uh, in the detector sensor of the camera it is not real light from the celestial object okay right? you can get over that it's you you have really bright objects to study so you can just simply do that now you can just repeat the, all the asteroid path prediction orbital determination astrometry on this data that you have and see if there's any discrepancy between what you are showing and what other people have found and you can just report that right? and there are various um, agencies that like these data to be taken so you could probably uh, submit it to them or it could just be your own project and you see that everything matches nicely <clears throat> so uh, i'll also uh, tell you that you could uh, with asteroids you could in fact look at occultations so sometimes uh, you know uh, these asteroids uh, which are very faint which may not be visible to the naked eye they are moving fast in the sky and they could be occulted which means they could go behind another brighter object in the sky so this could be uh, most often it is the moon because it moves in a very wide patch of the sky while going around the earth and uh, it, it, it also uh, encircles the ecliptic which is the plane of the uh, earth's orbit in around the sun so the other asteroids etc also frequent this orbit uh, so therefore uh, frequent this plane i mean to say and therefore the moon ends up occulting a lot of asteroids the lunar occultations have been extremely useful uh, not just uh, in the past but even and, and not just in the optical band but they have also been used in radio bands so uh, you can do op uh, occultation observations you can find out uh, actually uh, sometimes people have been able to find out that a asteroid has a, another satellite of its own right this was done with uh, um, occultations although direct observation with that sharp resolution was not possible with the telescopes we had earlier right you could uh, in fact also use the occultation of stars behind the moon or you could have a star going behind an asteroid <laughs> so there are several combinations which could happen in your own sky and if you keep a look out for these this could make up make up for very good projects to be undertaken and in fact these data could be extremely useful so uh, variable star observations are another thing as i said um, i mean you could you could have a star's brightness go down because uh, something is occulting it it could be an asteroid in our solar system but they could actually be a planet in its own system going around it and it's occulting it so it's going between the star and us and therefore the light reduces a bit so i think you should be able to uh, see in this picture here that as the days pass and the, you see the fraction day uh, the time uh, corner as it passes the star is you know becoming brighter and then going fainter so this there could be several reasons for this happening and the reasons could actually be found out from the uh, time periods of this so here is another star very well known um, star which is uh, which is uh, variable and this is uh, this is called algol it's in the perseus so for us northern hemisphere people perseus is a nice constellation towards the north and uh, this algol the alpha the brightest star of it is a variable star and it has a time period as you can see and it drops quite a lot so it goes from almost uh, close to 2.2 magnitude to almost 3.3 uh, or 4 magnitude you can see that's a magnitude difference of almost one it's quite a lot and it can even be just by the naked eye now this is known to us and you see how precise this is right but there might be other stars which uh, you want to do yourself you want to uh, find out the uh, or contribute to the existing data of uh, the time period so this is actually done by one of our amateur astronomers in pune and the data taken by them for this star the eclipsing binary star ab andromeda was actually taken by them um, on their own small uh, telescope i think it is a 10 inch telescope and uh, they used a dslr camera to do this and uh, it's, it's a like nice lovely curve which adds to the to you know these points at the end of the uh, true period 
So 0.331890 days. This is known, but this accuracy because of such results, because of people who are observing these stars and putting in their uh, observations after correcting their errors, which may have crept in. Right. So more and more observations actually define these kind of uh, databases. So you could do that. You could also do spectroscopy. Uh, I'm going slightly fast uh, this uh, this moment because yeah, there are, there are few things which you should definitely think of when you are having an astrolab. So you could do spectroscopy. Now this I would uh, suggest that you get a good spectroscope. Okay, uh, you could do spectroscopy of the sun itself, right? So you could have a diffraction uh, grating through which you pass the sunlight and then you make the diffraction pattern. As you know, this is what happens through white light. You get several orders of diffraction. Now you could have a simple spectrometer in your lab. Again, cut out the light of the sun a lot, then pass it through the spectrometer. And with the traveling telescope, you find out the you know, position of various lines on the solar spectrum. So as you can see here, there are various kinds of spectrum, which I need not tell you about. So there's continuous spectrum. And on top of it, there could be emission spectrum, like we see in stars. And there could be absorption spectrum, which is very prominent in the solar spectrum. So, and here is just an example of spectra of everyday bodies. So a bulb, an incandescent bulb, like a tungsten bulb, would give you a continuous spectrum. But uh, spectra of, let's say, a sodium uh, vapor lamp or a mercury vapor lamp would be very different. So this is a spectrum of a mercury vapor lamp, and this is a spectrum of a uh, sodium vapor lamp, right? with the yellow being very prominent. Now, don't ask me how I did this. I actually used a CD. In fact, a DVD, you all use DVD to do this diffraction. But let's say you invest in a good spectrometer, right? And you could actually go for study of the Fraunhofer lines. So this is a good, nice uh, project for MSc level. Uh, so you can, you can see that this is the first solar, solar spectrum taken in 1814 by Fraunhofer, right? And um, so this was the peak. And the, from that, we could judge what is the temperature of the sun. If you do this for maybe for the brighter stars, you could have your own catalog of uh, stars with their spectra. Right? And that is possible with a small telescope and a good spectrometer. Now you could have, let's say, an HR diagram made from that. And Hertzsprung Russell diagrams have been an extremely useful tool for uh, stellar astrophysics. And you must have studied uh, that uh, or heard of that uh, in one of the lectures. Now, that includes all the stars observed by uh, good telescopes and their data put together in, the, in uh, with these axis of color and uh, magnitude or luminosity, depending on what you're studying. So that gives you a nice uh, uh, you know, clumping of uh, the stars in a particular pattern. Now this is for, uh, let's say, uh, all the stars that could be studied. Maybe you could try doing it for a small stellar cluster, like an open cluster or a close you know, globular cluster, if you can see the stars surrounding it. Maybe you could find a different HR pattern in that particular uh, cluster and it could mean something. Right? So, so it's, it's, it's possible to do various kinds of uh, projects if you have a spectrometer as well. <laughs> now I'll uh, come to, of course, things which appeal more to the public and, of course, yourself. And these would probably be also good to get funds if you can show that people, show people and influential people <laughs> that you could have such good pictures taken. Well, jokes apart, uh, these are uh, breathtaking views of the earth and the sky that you could take with good cameras. And uh, you could also use telescopes uh, to get more uh, small field or small angle uh, views. This is basically this kind of a picture would require only a wide angle lens and a good camera. But that same camera can be used along with um, your uh, telescope to take pictures, not just uh, wide angle pictures, but also to study planets and other deep sky objects. So planets, you can see these are pictures actually taken by uh, good cameras with a small telescope, right? And you can see Jupiter, the details that of Jupiter that you can get, you can even get a good nicely lit image of uh, one of the uh, moons of it. You can see Titan and its rings, uh, sorry, Saturn and its rings, their plane changes many times. This is Mars with its uh, polar ice caps visible. This is Uranus and Neptune. 
they are pretty far off although they are big gi gas giants they won't be seen this big and i won't raise your hopes too much if you have a small telescope to look at this with so uh, you can do this you could also look at deep sky objects which are basically uh, objects which are too faint to see uh, with your naked eyes they are also very far off and the angular size is very very small so sometimes uh, so you, you, this is like uh, if you like have things like the uh, orion nebula their uh, their uh, challenge there is the faintness of it not the size but there might be uh, deep uh, sky objects like small galaxies which are very faint as well as very tiny so you could study these now uh, this all comes under astrophotography but all of it has uh, an, an, a, a use as data for astronomy as well the picture of um, the famous eagle nebula and you can compare how good this image is it's not quite a old image but you can still compare it with the image taken by hubble for example right so cumulative uh, exposures over many nights could actually give you extremely good resolution and extremely good pictures which could be useful as data as well a uh, picture of m81 and m82 galaxies these are uh, these are uh, this one uh, m82 is an actually a uh, very active galaxy and it's a side uh, side edge on galaxy and m81 is a nice spiral like our own it's probably a bubble spiral okay so the, these uh, kind of pictures can also be taken with your small telescope setup and your camera then uh, since i mentioned m81 and m82 these are not cryptic numbers but these are names of these objects which also have other names in other catalogs these are the names of these two uh, galaxies which are favorites of amateur astronomers and they are part of what is called the messier catalog so messier messier was a french astronomer if i have to pronounce it like that messier was a person who was a comet hunter and yes you can hunt comets with your own uh, small telescopes as well and there are several well known amateur astronomer japanese germans americans and uh, one indian who have actually discovered their own uh, own uh, comets they have been named after these people but they have used pretty small telescopes so uh, you so while uh, messier who was was not a current astronomer he was uh, there a long time back when there were no catalogs available he was still uh, adventurous enough to go looking out for comets in the sky and while hunting for them he would scan the sky very regularly and he would often be uh, fooled or <laughs> uh, irritated by some objects which looked like a comet and then he would go back to his previous data and or his memory in those times when there were no photographs and then he would realize oh this is something i've seen before so what he did was he actually noted down their positions and the, the named these objects in a catalog so there are around 100 uh, objects that he himself had cataloged and then 10 were later added by his students these have now become uh, known as the messier catalog objects uh, these are some of the most prominent and the most beautiful objects in the sky in fact so it's not a very uh, you know negligible kind of a list is a very important list and um, people in fact have taken it to the next level that uh, they find out nights particular nights when most of the messier objects would be visible you would note that the sun would obstruct some part of the sky at one time or the other during one particular day but they find a time when the sun is near the least number of messier objects and that night they go and try to do the messier marathon in which they start right at twilight in the evening and go on till the twilight in the next morning and try to look for all the messier objects in the sky and they can do this with uh, their own eyes or they could actually use a camera right so if you do this i am not saying you have to attempt and finish but even if you do you will get to know your instruments so much better because here you see you are actually challenging yourself and you are uh, trying to capture all these objects all in the uh, short amount of time of course uh, you can always stop and if you see something interesting you can stop and look at it and there will be the next night as well so uh, it it allows you of course to plan your observations as well now 
planning your observation is quite important. And as I have said earlier, that getting information is one big part of having a good setup. So uh, you, if you do all these projects, I think you'll be able to uh, become a better planner for astronomical observation. That is very important as we, uh, are, are, you might be people who are looking at a career in astronomy, astrophysics, and uh, if, it, it is great to always be in touch with what the instrument, what is the instrument that is giving you the data on which you are basing your science, right? And here, uh, this you know, indulgence in knowing about telescopes, your accessories, your um, imaging devices, etc., would actually make you much wiser about the data and what to trust, what not to trust. Also, it would make you wiser about when to get this data and how to get this data, right? There might be a several, amount, a several number of telescopes available to you, let's say in the next decade or the decade after that, but to choose which telescopes to use, which wave bands to use, etc., might be slightly easier if you already know of these things through actually using your own telescopes. And this is what also something I recommend the teachers in this group to do, that make sure your uh, students have hands-on experience. Uh, this may not seem, uh, sometimes may not seem worth the time and effort because you have to go to the roof, you have to spend nights, etc. But it is fun. Uh, let me tell you, uh, after you get over that initial scare or initial inertia, it is extremely uh, rewarding. And also it makes one an, uh, a wiser astronomer. Like all the great astronomers uh, and astrophysics that you uh, know of, uh, have been all-rounders and they had good, uh, uh, a very good idea of what instruments are being used to give them the data of uh, the theories that they make around them. So astronomy astrophysics becomes really complete when you have a good understanding of all the things. So with that, I will end here. I have uh, taken you uh, to we just go back to the main sli uh, slide, home slide so that you can note down my email address. Uh, I have been uh, I've tried to give you a short overview of uh, how you can build your own astrolab or just start off on a, on, a, on a newbie level with a small astro club, let's say, and very beginner level instruments also. So um, I'll take a moment to just look at the questions. You can keep them coming also. I'll uh, just borrow you myself. So somebody is asking for my email ID, which I've already given. And then, uh, okay. So, okay. So, um, Ishi uh, Nigam is asking, uh, what are the kind of advancements in telescopes? And uh, like in Hubble, are there any advancements? And uh, what is the scope of ground telescopes? Like what we can contribute with just ground telescopes? Well, they have their own advantages and disadvantages, I would say. Uh, I'm not going too deep into this because I'm not the expert in the uh, best telescopes in the world. But from my limited knowledge, what I know is that Yes, Hubble has its own place, but it also has its own limitations. Hubble is a telescope which went to space and then suddenly it's, it's, it's like Galileo looking at the whole sky with the only telescope in the world looking at the sky. So Hubble was the only uh, optical telescope looking at the sky with uh, the first two meter uh, kind of diameter mirror. Uh, however, uh, there are limitations uh, because the diameter is small, the less resolution cannot be good. So if we do end up making the 30 meter telescope, let's say on, on uh, Mauna Kea or uh, on the earth, or you could have the EELT, which is also to come, the European Extremely Large Telescope, this would be a 40 meter telescope. Now that uh, resolution, which it will give despite the earth's atmosphere 
right, would be unparalleled. So that cannot be matched by a space telescope unless you have, you know, enough power to launch really large uh, mirrors in the sky or make them in, on, let's say, moon or something. So right now, yes, uh, ground telescopes are a great investment and we are going with it. Okay, so uh, coming back to the topic which we were discussing is uh, how do I uh, build my own telescope in my home and uh, can I, so, okay, sorry. So somebody was making them and they uh, got stuck uh, it's at some point of time. Yes, so uh, you can please uh, contact us. I have given my email ID. Uh, probably uh, it's, it's very simple, scipop at gmail.com and uh, or you can just email me at samir, S-A-M-I-R at ayuka.in. I will give you access to this. Also on our uh, public outreach website, we have a small link saying how to make your own telescope. Go to that, that has very detailed uh, uh, instructions on how to make a telescope. You can find out where you're stuck and get rid of that. I can also give you other details if you contact me. Please uh, feel free to do that later. Okay, so is uh, is it possible to build a curved mirror from a piece of small mirror? Uh, so yes, uh, a curved mirror is actually built from a from a from a piece of <laughs> uh, flat glass. You don't even need a mirror. You need a flat glass. In fact, uh, we prefer to have float glass, which is a kind which is used in, let's say, uh, thick doors, thick glass doors or uh, glass panels in buildings, right? So we actually go to a, a person who uh, is a dealer in glass for such kind of uh, construction work, and we get them to cut a piece for us. Say, if you want a six inch, we get a get two pieces of glass, and one has to be put on top of another and ground with something called carborundum powder in between. And there is a way of doing this and slowly you grind them and make them polished. It's, it's, it's properly shape them and then polish them so that they're smooth and properly reflecting. Then we coat them with uh, most probably aluminum and they become a mirror. Right? So yes, you can make that. And there is a process again, which we can help you with if you contact us by email. <clears throat> okay. So uh, how can we deal with the extensive light pollution that I particularly face in cities? Well, uh, deal with is, uh, I, I'm not sure what uh, we can do. I mean, so the way to do is to go slightly outside the city, right? If you have smaller telescopes, they are easy to carry, or maybe you can take it in a, in a car or something and do some observations. Many of my friends, they do travel outside and uh, do observations from there. But if you are stuck to a city and have your observatory on top of a college which is inside the city, yes, you plan observations of brighter objects. So first, polish your hands. You, you, I mean, don't invest in extremely expensive things if you're stuck inside a city. That's something I would suggest. So if, if, uh, if you do that, it probably uh, not be so useful. But if you have something in the city, and then you want to plan something with it, then go for the brighter objects. So as I said, uh, things like the moon, sun are always there, but then you could also go for things like asteroids, which despite uh, the uh, light pollution, you could easily uh, observe and track. You could go for occultations of uh, various kinds of objects, and these uh, all need to need you to time for uh, the, the disappearance or appearance. So this is something which you could do for brighter objects and still have some good experience with it. I will not suggest going for like, uh, you know, a spectroscopy of a galaxy or something. That will be very difficult because galaxies are often faint and lower than 10 magnitude. So they would be difficult to find and observe. Okay, so, uh, okay, how can you, how, how can we share the, uh, uh, somebody is asking me, how can we share our photographs where, with Ayuka and be part of the Ayuka Photography Club? Well, we don't have a photography club as such. Uh, not, yeah. So we don't have a, a photography club, but if you, if you want to share with us, uh, you're welcome. In fact, in the days of social media, you don't need to share uh, 
uh, our pictures uh, directly. Yeah, really you can just simply uh, upload your pictures and tag us with that. So our <coughs> our um, email ID and our uh, social media handle are the same. SciPop, S C I P O P. That is short form science, short for science popularization. Okay. So just go for SciPop, look it up. Uh, it, it is there on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channel as well. So SciPop is the uh, uh, tag uh, is the tag that you should look for, and you just tag us on uh, Facebook, and we'll get to know them. We'll appreciate that. Okay. So. This is for everyone. And you can also email us at cypop at gmail.com. Let me look quickly at the YouTube uh, uh, questions if there are any. Yes, somebody commented that Starling is the worst nightmare for a backyard astronomer. I agree right now. Uh, and I don't know what is the solution for that. They are, they are nuisance for professional astronomers as well. Okay. So can we observe the night sky with Ayuka instruments? Uh, well, so Ayuka has a, has a science center where we do have a small telescope and we have some programs for amateur astronomers. Uh, what we have done in the past is if you are part of an amateur astronomy program uh, anywhere, or a group anywhere, you can write to us and then we can discuss what is the kind of observation that you want to do. But in general, if you just want to come and be part of a sky watching program or something, you're welcome uh, to Ayuka. We have a program on every Friday. If you are in Pune, just drop in uh, in the evening after sunset and we'll take you through the sky and not <laughs> literally, but uh, through our telescopes and our descriptions, we will tell you what is up there and you can also get answers to your other questions, which may not be answered, all answered in this talk. So I can see that uh, that is kind of the, okay, this uh, a relevant question just came up. What is the approximate starting budget to build your own telescope? I think if uh, people are still there and they're interested, uh, well, if you want to build your own, let's say six inch telescope, I would just double the, the aperture and that will be the price in thousands. Okay, so uh, approximately if you want to make a four inch, five inch telescope, five inch let's say, it will cost you close to 10,000 uh, rupees to make the tube, the, <clears throat> to get the tube, to get, make the mirror yourself, polish it and then uh, aluminize it and get a very uh, basic uh, cast iron altas mount. Okay, so that's where it starts. So you can go right beyond uh, from 10,000. And then uh, slowly as the advancement of budget happens, things also become less and less uh, possible to make yourself. So then you get ready-made things and uh, then the price increases. Of course, uh, if, if you still are interested in making it, I would <clears throat> suggest you go for a six or eight inch telescope uh, because that is the kind of uh, best um, appropriate kind of uh, investment that you can have. Now these telescopes uh, need to be of course cared for. So if you keep the telescope properly, uh, sh shut the, the lid every time, you park it properly, you keep it covered, keep it dust free, etc. The single coating can last for many, many years, right? Even decades. So uh, otherwise you would have to do the coating. So that would add to the cost. But uh, I would suggest that you start with your own uh, mirror first, make your own telescope, small one, six or eight inch, and then you uh, advance your accessories later as you go. Okay. So um, somebody asking me, Nakshatra Science, uh, I run a science community. Can you recommend observational projects for undergraduate level students? I did recommend a few of them through the talk. So if uh, if you just rewind the talk later and go through it, you will find several suggestions there. Uh, for you're asking that what can be done remotely? Well, if you're asking for remotely with Ayuka, well, we don't have actually have any uh, 
instruments that we can uh, give you uh, remote access to. But <clears throat> on the internet, you may be able to find several telescopes, which uh, for a small fee uh, will allow you online access. These might be telescopes which are in the USA, which are of no use in their daytime, which is actually really night time for us. So, uh, so we can use it in the daytime when it's night time for them and they pay a small fee for their use there uh, online and you can please have a look. Okay, so I think uh, after this, uh, with this, uh, uh, all the questions are over. I don't have any more here. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, the talk has given you some pointers or some push along a direction where you would want to make your own telescope or at least use one in your early career. Uh, for the teachers, I hope uh, that you would make efforts to get these telescopes accessible to your students. And also, uh, if you have a budget, then you can choose properly so that uh, you can spend the budget in things which can be easily handled to give experience to the students and then also to give them a research experience later. So try to choose not just one telescope, but a set of them so that they could cater to various levels of expertise and also you know, help students to develop rather than uh, reserving the final best telescope uh, at the end and then them not knowing what to do with it uh, because they've never handled a telescope before and are afraid of it. So uh, with this uh, suggestions, I would like to uh, thank everyone for being attentive and listening to this. Again, if you have any questions and or comments, please feel free to send me at scipop at gmail.com or to the uh, IU